Hi everyone, today we'd like to talk about the two degree field galactic redshift survey. Uh, this is a data exercise in Astro 322. And uh, the 2DF is a way that we will study the structure of the universe at the largest scales. The image that you see here is actually a numerical simulation. This is a three-dimensional rendering by the illustrious TNG collaboration, and it illustrates the three-dimensional structure of dark matter in the universe. And you can see this connected filamentary structure is a manifestation of how matter collapses uh, over the course of the universe. And dark matter goes and forms this large-scale network uh, throughout the universe. And the gas in the early universe gets pulled down into these potential wells and the dense halo regions that we see here is where we form galaxies. Of course, we can't observe this, but what we can do is examine the large-scale structure of the dark matter field through the process of studying galaxies. And so that's what we're going to look at today using a sample of data from the Two Degree Field Galactic Redshift Survey. Uh, the web website here, 2dfdrs.net, shows you uh, if you want to look at some more uh, data here. Uh, but this used the, a new instrument upgrade back around the year 2000 in, uh, the, uh, on the Anglo-Australian Telescope at Siding Spring Observatory in Australia. Uh, the 2DF imager allowed this 3.9 meter telescope to access a fairly large field of view. And what the survey team did is they used that field of view to uh, observe light over this field and use that to feed a fiber fed spectrograph. And so it was a 400 fiber uh, optical spectrograph. And what that does is it, uh, when we say that, what that you see is uh, the focal plane of the telescope actually gets filled with a plate like you see here. This is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which illustrates these optical plates, but this is a metal plate that is machined with holes in it that uh, are placed so that when the uh, telescope is pointed up onto the galaxy, the light from individual objects falls into each one of these holes and to the back of each hole is connected a fiber. I'm gonna put a link here, hopefully in a YouTube card, uh, let's say right up here, and it's going to take you to this neat little uh, segment that shows how the fibers are plugged for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, and it's this process by which you then connect this to this object optical uh, spectrometer, put it on the telescope, and then steer it up and look at a field for several hours and a night to gather all of this light. Each one of these fibers yields the spectrum of that object. So we get a 400 sets of spectra for one pointing at uh, a given spot on the sky. So this gives us this data set from a spectrum. Uh, they can measure a redshift from the emission and absorption lines in the spectrum. And that gives them a map of what we see uh, in the, uh, uh, it gives them a map of spectrum as well as where things are on the sky. And those are gonna be our three basic measurements here. Uh, this is an actual image from the two uh, degree field GRS, and we're going to recreate uh, this image using their data. Overall, the survey covered a full 2,000 square degrees. Uh, they selected targets from this uh, effort called the Automated Plate Measuring Catalog. Now, this is from truly back in the day, uh, the um, early telescopes surveying the sky, and in particular in the Southern Hemisphere, was relatively undersurveyed. And so they uh, would make these images on glass photographic plates with a uh, chemical, uh, uh, chemical substrate that when light fell on it, uh, it would uh, turn uh, darker when developed, uh, giving you these images of the sky. And so original technology for doing kind of quantitative astronomy was these photographic plates. And there was this huge catalog of sky surveys from early telescopes. And the uh, automated plate measuring effort went through and scanned each of these telescopes with a machine and turned them into a digitized image from which the uh, survey team uh, and their collaborators extracted a catalog of targets that they thought were going to be galaxies. 
Uh, the full uh, 2DF GRS has over a quarter million sources in it, uh, but we're going to focus on a subset of 84,000 and a bit here uh, to do our data set. And so I've provided that link to you on uh, the class website, and we can take a look at what is inside the data file. Uh, so when you load it up into Glue, you get uh, the, a uh, file here, which we can drop into our uh, Glue window, and it brings it up with the categories uh, here. And I can give a right ascension and a declination uh, for the sources. And this shows uh, the map of where those sources are on the sky. I can sort of shrink it down. And you can see that this looks like an uh, image sort of like what we saw from the Z0 MGS survey from last time, except this is a much smaller portion of the sky. And the galaxies we're looking at are much farther away. Uh, so what you can see is there's this sort of outline of structures. You can sort of see the footprint of one of their plates right here, these little circular extensions. That's kind of the footprint of the instrument. And then you can also see areas that couldn't be readily observed here as these little holes here in the uh, uh, survey. So uh, these are the sources that we have included in our uh, data set. And from there, uh, we can dive in and look at the large scale structure of the universe. Now the math that we're going to use involves the Hubble law, and we're going to be measuring the distances to galaxies in terms of the relationship seen by Hubble, this sort of linear relationship, that the apparent velocity uh, is equal to the Hubble constant times the distance to the target, with uh, h naught in our class will be using 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But really what we're going to be using is the relationship uh, in this non-relativistic case of uh, v is equal to c times z, where z is the uh, redshift defined as the observed wavelength divided by the rest wavelength. So given that, we can return to glue, and instead uh, of looking at this uh, space in right ascension and declination, what we can do is make a plot kind of like that cone plot that we saw earlier. So I could do this, uh, again, with 2D scatter, and I could just put in a right ascension on one coordinate and then a redshift on the other coordinate and kind of get my perspective here. Uh, and I could even make this into a polar plot where uh, the angle is right ascension, uh, the radius is uh, z, and then we have to change that to degrees. And you can kind of see the slice in the 2df here. Now the problem with this plot in glue is it doesn't quite work very well because the polar plots don't um, behave uh, with zooming and selecting as nicely as they should. So what we're going to do is uh, actually just turn this into a set of Cartesian coordinates. And we're going to create kind of an XY space using our polar angle projection here. So we're going to say that X is going to be equal to the redshift times the cosine of the right ascension. So we can put in the right ascension here to make sure I got the right name. And again, cosine is always in radians. So that gives me x coordinates here. And then I can do the same thing for a new attribute just called y. That's equal to z times np dot sine of, we're just going to do the ra again, um, times np dot pi over 180. And I'm going to note that uh, there should be a deck term here that's uh, taking into account uh, the declination. But for our purposes, uh, we're not going to actually include it uh, because the declinations in this sample are all close to zero and this cosine term is negligible. So let's just keep it simple for this uh, case and stick it in there. If you want to go for it, uh, go for it, really. Uh, so this gives us the two expressions that we want to see, and we'll bring this in as a 2D scatter plot, and I will show that x and that y coordinate, and then we have uh, a large scale structure of the universe that we can properly zoom in on and take a look at stuff. So yeah, that is basically what we want to see. And I can turn down the opacity 
and I start to see that structure, or I can change the scaling and sort of see it. And that is the large scale structure of the universe here. Now, the coordinates x and y are measured here in terms of redshift units, because our radio coordinates were redshift. And so they are negative here. And so the only thing that really makes sense is to describe this in terms of distances in this space, which are measured in redshift radially from my origin here. I also kind of want to note that there's some garbage in here. Uh, and you'll notice that even uh, though we are confined to the positive part of the sky, uh, let me make this a little clearer here, uh, there are things over here in this other slice, uh, and those are representing the redshifts of uh, things that were negative. So these could be things like local group galaxies, which are moving towards us, and other things uh, with a negative redshift. So this part right around zero is a little garbagey, so we don't want to look at it because that's not really tracing the motions of the large-scale structure of the universe. You'll also notice that there's this weird kind of pattern. It almost looks like uh, a broadcasting icon or something. That's because the redshifts have been digitized to fixed uh, intervals. So they didn't measure them more precisely uh, than a separation. So everything could only have a fixed redshift. So these rings are those uh, separations in redshift. So uh, given that, I can go back to my uh, zoomed-in view, uh, and you'll notice that uh, a lot of things are apparent here. First, we have the origin, we have the large-scale structure of the universe, and then things fade out with only a few points back here. And this is because you can't really uh, see uh, objects far away because they have the inverse square law, which is further augmented by the cosmological redshift, which can kind of drag down uh, the apparent flux of an object to even lower than you might expect. So things fade off here pretty quickly, and the 2D FGRS team did a really hard work to make sure that they were trying to get basically uniform sampling within each of these redshift bins. But right here in the core of things, we can really get a good sense of what's happening. Uh, so the assignment asks you to do uh, a few things. Uh, the first is to look at a cluster and look for these long linear features. And you can sort of see these. They look like streaks coming out of the origin. And what we ask you to do, like here's a good one right up here. You could use this one. We're going to try to find an object with this sort of long linear structure. Let's uh, get a slightly better zoom on that. And I want you to use that to measure the actual velocity of the cluster. So we'll go in here, and you can sort of see this here. And remember, this is trying to remind you that the redshift is both the cosmological redshift from the Hubble flow, but it's also the internal motions of clusters. And I would like for you to measure basically the extent of one of these clusters. Part of that will be cosmology, and part of that will be the velocity spread of the cluster. And I want you to figure out what a typical velocity spread for your cluster is. So all you have to do is identify a cluster, figure out the sort of uh, extent in the radial direction, translate that into um, redshift units, and remember it's in distance units. So you might have to do a little Pythagorean theorem work uh, to figure it out. This is an estimate. Don't worry about too much, just sort of explain the feature that you have adopted, estimate its length, and then use the Hubble law to sort of figure out what the kind of, or not the Hubble law, the redshift property to figure out what uh, velocity range that would correspond to. The other thing that I'm asking you to do is to look for these things that we call voids. And you can sort of see voids here as the holes. And these aren't precisely defined, so again, we're not too worried about the precision, but you look for these empty parts of the uh, redshift space. Those voids here are representing the places that are inside where the filament network has pulled material away from, leaving behind an under density. It's not completely empty, but boy, is it a much lower density region compared to these long sheets and filaments that we see here in redshift space. And I'd like for you to use the Hubble law to measure the radius of that. So remember again that we're in redshift units, uh, sort of moving 
this way. And what that means is that we need to um, measure it radially from the origin, the sort of side to side coordinates. Those aren't actual distances uh, because um, it's in sort of uh, uh, RA deck space. Uh, but here you should be able to just measure the radial distance again using the uh, distance sort of on a radial line coming out of the origin. So if I was going to measure this particular hole, I'd want to measure this length sort of like this since the origin is over here. Uh, we sort of measure that extent in redshift and use that to figure out a distance with the Hubble law. Then the final thing I ask you to take a look at isn't in this uh, redshift space at all. I mean, I invite you to sort of contemplate this uh, and sort of see the large scale structure of the universe yourself uh, from this data set and think about all these wonderful clusters that are in here. Uh, but the other thing I want you to do is take a look at the colors of the galaxies. And so I could uh, make a uh, uh, it should just indicate that there is this other, uh, these other two uh, measurements, which are measured as B mag sub S and BJ mag sub S and R mag sub S. And so what you can see is that there's essentially kind of in this a color color kind of plot here. We can see there's sort of a correlated structure of galaxies here. And this is just the magnitude of the galaxies that are included. And so from that, I can actually make a measurement of the color. I can say that uh, B minus R is just going to be, let's make sure I get these right, B, sorry, B, use the BJ mag underscore S minus R. And so B is the bluer color and R is the redder color, kind of like the Gaia bands that we were using earlier in the class. And so this gives us a B minus R color. What I'd like for you to do is make this particular plot which is a 2D scatter plot of the uh, redshift on one axis, and then the B minus R color on the other axis, and look at it over the range where we have some uh, signal here. And there's this trend. Eh, don't worry about the stuff over here, but really, what causes this here? And I'd like to understand why there's a bit of a tilt to these data. So go ahead and have a think about it. And I think you can pull it apart from what you know about galaxy spectral energy distributions and the nature of what redshift is doing. So give it a think and uh, see if you can come up with an explanation for this particular plot. All right, that kind of gives you the pieces that you need to get going on this. Uh, so I hope that you can enjoy exploring the uh, structure of the universe a little bit. It's, you know, all in a day's work. Uh, so really grateful that uh, the 2DF team had such a nice data set. And it's amazing that you can just work with us on a laptop these days uh, and really explore all of these uh, results. Uh, 20 years ago, this was a much more challenging uh, analysis uh, effort. So yeah, give that a try and uh, see how it goes.